Good evening, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kathleen Wellesby, visiting professor at Korea University. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Kathleen Wellesby. Dr. Kathleen Wellesby received a PhD in Modern Russian History from Indiana University in 1990. Her second field was Modern East Asian History, and for her dissertation, she chose the subject of Soviet involvement in Korea, Korea after World War II. This was a lucky choice, because in 1991, she received a research grant to work in Moscow, just to hand the communist government collapsed. Over the next several years, with a lot of effort and additional research grants, she got access to archives that hold the most important records of the history of the Korean War from the communist side. Russian documents reveal how the decision was made to start the war and how North Korea and China carried out the war under the direction of the Soviet Union. Dr. Wedersby has published widely on this subject and has lectured about the Korean War in many countries. The Ministry of Patriots, Patriots and Veterans Affairs of the Republic of Korea has honored her war by bestowing on her the civilian order of merit. I'm pleased that she's now teaching at Korea University and is working together with me to create a digital archive on the, on the international history of the Korean War. Tonight's lecture is about how the world began. I believe we are in for a real treat. Now, please welcome Dr. Kevin Weathersby with, with a warm round of applause. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here, and it's, it's a great delight. I'm, I'm so glad all of you made time to come. Uh, the first question to ask about this particular topic is uh, why should we focus on the outbreak? Uh, the war lasted three years. It was an extremely complicated event involving many, many countries. It changed the course of international affairs as well as the course of Korean history. There are all kinds of things we can talk about about the terrible war in Korea. Uh, but why choose the decision to start it? Um, well, first of all, it's because it's still contested between South and North Korea. North Korea uh, still maintains that the war began uh, by the United States and the South invading uh, the North. That is still uh, what is put forward publicly. Most importantly, it is what people in North Korea are taught as they grow up. Um, so for that reason, the question strongly affects the relations between South and North Korea. At the same time, the question of the outbreak of the war, how it actually uh, began, who and how and why, uh, you know, was the decision, by whom and how and why, was the decision uh, made uh, to begin an all-out attack on South Korea is extremely important for the international environment because it was perceptions of how, of what this meant, of how the decision was taken that led uh, so many countries to intervene on behalf of South Korea. I have here a picture of the flags I'm sure you all recognize this site. 
Uh, they're in front of the War Memorial of Korea, representing all the flags that uh, were part of the UN command during the war. But it was because the United States saw uh, this attack as a Soviet action, right, uh, that the United States intervened. If they had thought it was only a North Korean action, uh, they may well not have. Uh, but it was viewed as an action by the Soviet Union that was a kind of probe, a test of resolve that if uh, the United States and other Western countries did not go to the defense of South Korea, then just like what happened in the 30s with Nazi Germany, when they were not uh, stopped as they began invading other countries, if the Soviets were not stopped in Korea, they would keep going and we would end up in World War III. That was a unanimous way of looking at what happened in uh, countries that had been so heavily involved uh, with World War II who had, that had been uh, the victims of German attack. So the United States took the issue to the UN immediately. They wanted uh, to strengthen the United Nations in the course of defending South Korea, and that's why the U.S. didn't simply make a unilateral defense of South Korea. They knew that the military effort would be overwhelmingly American, but they wanted it to be a U.N. Uh, action. The resolution passed, and 15 other countries joined the U.N. Uh, command. Uh, you see them listed here. The ones in Europe, uh, the U.K., also France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, joined because of fear of Soviet attack on Western Europe. Turkey and Greece had a very particular fear of Soviet attack because of Soviet pressure on their countries at the end of World War II, and so they were particularly eager to join. There are many Greek uh, soldiers and Turkish soldiers who lost their lives here in Korea. Canada joined as a member of the British Commonwealth, as did uh, New Zealand and South Africa. Australia had an additional reason to join because there was fear of Chinese-backed communist movement moving down towards Australia. The same was true of the Philippines. There was already a, a communist insurgency in the Philippines, so they were eager to join in this effort. Colombia joined as well, uh, important contribution from South America. Thailand joined uh, because of its concern of, about the communist movement in China. Ethiopia joined because of military connections to Western powers. And then there were medical units from Denmark, India, Italy, Norway, and Sweden. This was a huge international event. So what does the historical evidence tell us? Um, were all of these countries correct in viewing this as a Soviet action? Yeah. As a test of Western resolve? So that's what the uh, Russian archives uh, can tell us. But first we have to back up a little bit uh, when we look at why the war began, how it began, we have to start with the creation of two hostile states in Korea. Of course, there would have been no war between North and South Korea if there had been no North and South Korea. Uh, so just briefly, it was the Soviets and the Americans who uh, created this tragic situation, having jointly occupied Korea at the end of the war against Japan, they agreed in December of 45 to create a provisional government, a unified provisional government, to take over from the military uh, governments set up at the end of the war. But they could never agree on a composition uh, of that government 
Both of them were worried about Japan. The Soviets were worried that Japan would remilitarize and again threaten the Soviet Union. Uh, that seems a bit strange now, perhaps, because it's been such a long time and that has not happened. But in 1945, it did not seem strange at all uh, to people in Russia to fear Japanese attack in the future. Japan had occupied a big portion of Siberia for four years from 1918 to 1922. In the 1930s, Japan considered moving into Siberia to get the oil that it needed for its military industry. It only decided against doing that uh, when the Soviet army defeated it in a battle in uh, 1939. So it was a very, uh, very real threat from uh, Japan. Just because they were defeated in 1945 did not persuade Stalin that that threat had ended. Just as Germany had rebuilt after World War I, he assumed that Japan would rebuild after World War II. And if Japan was going to attack the Soviet Union, the most likely route for doing that would be to come through Korea. So the government of Korea was very important to the Soviet leadership. It had to be friendly to Moscow so that it would not allow Japan uh, to use Korea to attack the Soviet Union. The United States was also worried about Japan. <laughs> It was worried that Japan might come under communist government and ally itself with the Soviet Union. And if that happened, then all of the resources, the potential war-making capacity of Japan would be added to the resources of the Soviet Union, and that could tip the balance in the global struggle that was emerging that we called the Cold War. And so because of that, for the US, it was important that Korea not have a completely communist government, because that would put too much pressure on Japan, make it more likely that Japan would end up with a communist government. So the nature of the government in Korea was considered very important by both of the superpowers. And so naturally, they could not agree on creating a provisional government. that had, They had opposite goals. By 1938, the US turned the issue over to the United Nations. This is what the United Nations was supposed to do. It's what it was designed to do, so that was a logical thing to do. Um, the, US, the UN decided to hold elections. Um, but the Soviet Union predictably would not allow the elections to be held in the north. They had established a buffer state north of the 38th parallel. That was some protection against a future attack from Japan. They were not going to give that up by allowing elections to be held. So the elections were held only in the south and the Republic of Korea was created then August of 1948. Here we have a picture of Syngman Rhee at the establishment of the Republic of Korea. But the Republic of Korea was established as the government for all of Korea. Right? Um, as a result, after it was set up as the government for all of Korea, the leadership in the North had to do something. <laughs> they couldn't simply let this stand. And so the next month they established the Democratic People's Republic of Korea with its headquarters in, or its capital in Seoul, according to their constitution. They were not physically in Seoul, but according to the first constitution, the capital was Seoul. And the Democratic People's Republic of Korea then was the government for all of Korea. So this is uh, a recipe for conflict, if there ever was one. I brought something to show you that might interest you. Uh, someone brought it to me a few years ago. They picked it up in uh, Pyongyang. 
This is a map of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, published in 2009, so just eight years ago. So what I want you to note, those of you close enough to see it, is what the boundaries are. This is a map of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. As of 2009, oh, okay. as, of, as of eight years ago. All right. So what are the boundaries of the DPRK according to Pyongyang? Yeah. <laughs> the entire peninsula. Well, of course, as the two states were created, their political systems were quite different. Syngman Rhee in the South aspired to create a liberal democracy, however much those goals were compromised in following years, nonetheless, that was his intention at the beginning. Kim Il-sung was a communist, a true believer, I uh, wanted to bring communist revolution to Korea, believing that this was the way uh, for his country to prosper. So how to resolve this dispute? First, in 1948, in the fall, after the two states were established, uh, the North supported a number of um, insurgencies in the South, right, uprisings in the South. These were quite large, quite widespread. The, the history of them is very well known here in South Korea. The goal was to overthrow Lee Sing Man's government by force, by domestic uprising. Uh, there was a belief that the majority of the population supported the communist side. There were certainly many in the South who did. And so the idea was if we just begin an uprising, uh, we will be victorious. People will rise up and join us. Uh, that didn't happen. Instead, the police forces of the Republic of Korea uh, put down this uprising quite effectively. Consequently, uh, the following year, a um, new approach was taken by both sides. There was a lot of fighting along the border, along the 38th parallel, by police forces, some by military forces. Also, as the reality of the existence of these two competing states sunk in, uh, the leadership in the South was so outraged and frustrated. Uh, Lee Sing Man had been working his entire life for the independence of Korea. It's not difficult to imagine the, you know, the tremendous stress uh, he would have had seeing that, you know, the country is now uh, divided in this totally you know, intolerable manner. And so he talked about marching north, right, to unify Korea under the control of the Republic of Korea. However, the United States was thoroughly in charge of the military situation in the South uh, because at the end of the war against Japan, the U.S. occupied the South. Korea had been part of Japan, and therefore all military forces in Korea came under control of the United States at the end of the war. Right. So therefore, whatever military was created in the South was created in cooperation uh, with the occupying power. And the U.S. decided uh, that the last thing it wanted was to be involved in some kind of conflict in Korea. So it refused to supply offensive weapons uh, to the South or even very effective defensive 
weapons. If you go to the War Memorial of Korea, and I, I hope all of you will go if you haven't been there yet, you will see on uh, early in the exhibit on the Korean War quite a good chart showing the, the weapons held by the North in June of 1950 and the weapons held by the South. The disparity it was immense. Right? The South really was very lightly armed. The U.S. in particular did not want a conflict with the Soviet Union. North Korea was a uh, Soviet client state. And so the U.S. was at all costs going to avoid anything that would lead it into conflict with the Soviet Union. This was just five years after World War II ended. Uh, the U.S. was also very extensively demobilized at the end of World War II. Again, it's a little hard to believe the extent to which that happened because ever since the war in Korea, the US military has been enormous. Um, but it was not in 1949, right? The American uh, tradition was not to maintain a large army in peacetime. And so the size of the armed forces was reduced to about 10% of what it had been uh, during the war. That affected it also. So what about uh, the North Korean side? Kim Il-sung also wanted to use military force. Uh, but the situation there was rather different. Um, first of all, there was an assumption on the part of the communist allies that using military force to bring about unification of the country and communist revolution was perfectly normal, right? <laughs> this is what uh, China was doing in early 49 when Kim first raised this possibility. Uh, this is what the Soviet Union itself had done. This is what the Vietnamese communists were trying to do. This was normal, right? Quite proper. This was the way to bring about communist revolution. So it was not the goal in and of itself that was in question or the means toward that goal that were in question. When Kim Il-sung asked for Stalin's approval and his support, the only issue was whether or not the timing was right, whether or not the circumstances were favorable. Right. So, in 1949, um, Kim Il-sung requested again, after first raising the issue in March, he requested again in September after U.S. forces left uh, South Korea in the summer of 49. And at that point, the Soviet government was willing to consider it uh, because U.S. forces had left. All right. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, so they sent a list of questions right, for the North Koreans to answer. They answered the questions, sent them back. Uh, but Moscow decided no. And it's interesting why. Uh, first of all, the very sensible reason that mm, they considered the North Korean military not sufficiently superior to the South uh, to make a quick victory. And if it weren't a quick victory, that would give American forces time to come back. And they didn't want that uh, to happen. But also we see that they raised the issue of how the people of Korea would respond to the North beginning a fratricidal war. So we see even in their internal discussions they were aware of what they were doing, <laughs> that they were planning to set Korean against Korean. And they were aware that that was a problematical thing. That was part of their, part of their calculation. In January of 1950, then Kim Il-sung began to talk about this possibility again. 
this time at a luncheon that was held on January 19 uh, to send off to Beijing the first North Korean ambassador uh, to Beijing because uh, the People's Republic of China had just been established in October. So now the Chinese Communists are in power. They have just done what Kim Il-sung so desperately wants to do in Korea. So after this luncheon, sending off the new ambassador, I have some quotes here for you. This is from the Russian uh, report of this luncheon sent back to Moscow. Kim Il-sung addressing the advisors, Ignatiev and Peloshenko, in an excited manner began to speak about how now when China is completing its liberation, the liberation of the Korean people in the south of the country is next in line. The people of the southern portion of Korea trust me and rely on our armed might. Partisans will not decide the question. Partisans had been used in the fall of 48, but that didn't work. Right? The people of the south know we have a good army. Lately, I do not sleep at night thinking about how to resolve the question of the unification of the whole country. Further, Kim stated that when he was in Moscow, Comrade Stalin said to him that it was not necessary to attack the South in case of an attack on the north of the country by the army of Isingman, then it's possible to go on the counter offensive to the South. But since Riesingman is still not instigating an attack, it means that the liberation of the people of the southern part of the country and the unification of the country are being drawn out. That he, Kim Il-sung, thinks he needs again to visit Comrade Stalin and receive an order and permission for offensive action by the People's Army for the purpose of the liberation of the people of southern Korea. Further, Kim stated that he himself cannot begin an attack because he's a communist, a disciplined person, and for him the order of Comrade Stalin is law. There was a lot of debate for many years about whether Kim Il-sung did this on his own or whether he had to rely on Stalin, but the records found in the Russian archives make it quite clear what that situation was. So how did Stalin respond when he sent, received this report? The very end of January, he sent a telegram to Shlikov, the Soviet ambassador. I received your report. I understand the dissatisfaction of comrade Kim Il-sung, but he must understand that such a large matter in regard to South Korea such as he wants to undertake, needs large preparation. The matter must be organized so that there would not be too great a risk. Risk of what? <laughs> risk to whom? Well, <laughs> risk to the Soviet Union of an American uh, reaction. If he wants to discuss this matter with me, I will always be ready to receive him and to discuss with him, transmit all this to Kim Il-sung and tell him that I am ready to help him in this matter. Tell him I am ready to help him in this matter. So Kim went to Moscow along with Foreign Minister Pak Han Young on the uh, 30th of March, stayed there until April 25 uh, to plan the offensive. It took a while before the discussions uh, emerged from the archives, but they finally did. I was immensely glad about that. So we finally got this record of a summary of the conversations that Kim Il-sung and Pak Han Young had with Stalin during that month that they were in Moscow. And these conversations give Stalin's reasoning for why he agreed to help Kim Il-sung. He explained that the international environment had changed and that permitted a more active stance on the unification of Korea. So what had changed in the international environment? He helpfully enumerated it. 
The Chinese Communist Party's victory over the Kuomintang has improved the environment for actions in Korea. Okay. China is no longer busy with internal fighting and can devote its attention and energy to the assistance of Korea. If necessary, China has at its disposal troops that can be used in Korea without any harm to the other needs of China. All right, practical matter. China can send troops if North Korea needs them now that China's civil war is over. Moreover, the Chinese victory is also important psychologically. It has proved the strength of Asian revolutionaries and shown the weakness of Asian reactionaries and their mentors in the West. In America, Americans left China and did not dare to challenge the new Chinese authorities militarily. So the US didn't fight for the big prize of China. It's not going to fight for the little prize of Korea, to put it crudely. Now that China has signed a treaty of alliance with the USSR, which happened in February of 1950, Americans will be even more hesitant to challenge the communists in Asia. And then he says, according to information coming from the US, it really is so. The prevailing mood is not to interfere. I think what he's referring to there is the American defense uh, policy adopted at the very end of December, shortly before he received this report of Kim's you know, very agitated comments at the luncheon. This new defense policy is what was announced by uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson. It's often called the Acheson Line. So the Americans drew a defense perimeter in East Asia in response to the Chinese Communist victory that basically pulled back American security commitments to a line going to the west of Japan and the west of the Philippines saying that the rest was really beyond the resources of the US to try to change. And that included Korea. Right. So South Korea was not inside the American defense perimeter. And I think this, naturally enough, shaped Stalin's thinking. At that point, uh, the US and the Soviet Union were engaged in a worldwide struggle. If the US is pulling back to this line in East Asia, what is Stalin going to do? <laughs> I tell my classes, I ask my classes, and they all say, he'll move up to that line. Yes, exactly. It's not very complicated. Yeah. So I think that's what was happening. Such a mood, he says, is reinforced by the fact that the USSR now has the atomic bomb, they tested their first one in August of 49, and that our positions are solidified in Pyongyang. However, we have to weigh once again all the pros and cons. First of all, will the Americans interfere or not? Second, the liberation can be started only if the Chinese leadership endorses it. That's logical. He was counting on them to intervene. He emphasized that a thorough preparation for the war was a must. All right. So he understood this was a very serious thing at risk, serious consequences if it pulled the US into the, in, uh, into the event. So first of all, armed forces have to be elevated. These are just ordinary things to a high level of preparedness. You have to form elite attack divisions. Divisions have to have more weapons, more mechanized means of movement and combat. Your request in this respect will be fully satisfied. And indeed, the Soviets did send all the necessary uh, supplies, vehicles, equipment. Then a detailed plan of the offensive must be drawn. Has to have basically three stages. First, you concentrate the troops, then the highest powers in North Korea make fresh proposals for peaceful unification. These will certainly be rejected by the other side. Then 
after they are rejected, a counterattack must take place. I agree with your idea to engage the adversary in the Yongjin Peninsula, as it will help to disguise who initiated the combat. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. So after you attack and the South counterattacks, it would give you a chance to enlarge the front. The war should be quick and speedy. Southerners and Americans should not have time to come to their senses. They won't have time to put up a strong resistance and mobilize international support. So it's very important in the timing of the, of the preparation of the war. It has to, be, has to be a massive force. They have to move quickly. It all has to be over before international forces can intervene. So the middle of May, Kim Il-sung went to uh, Beijing as required by Stalin, met with Mao. Mao agreed to the plan, explaining that he understood the Soviets couldn't uh, send forces to Korea, but the Chinese could do so. By the end of May, Ambassador Stikov, this is a picture of him, reported to Stalin on the status of the preparations. Most of the armaments and equipment all right, have already arrived. Kim Il-sung inspect inspected the newly in, uh, formed divisions and came to the conclusions they would be ready for fighting by the end of June. Chief of General Staff of the KPA, Korean People's Army, has prepared the overall program for the offensive, which he's reported to Kim Il-sung together with General Vasiliev. This was worked out together with Soviet officials, of course, uh, because this was a conventional military offensive. North Korean uh, soldiers had been fighting in Manchuria and in North China for a long time together with Chinese communist forces. They were very effective guerrillas, the, the ones who had been fighting there. Uh, but they were not doing conventional offensive actions. They were fighting as guerrillas. And so for an operation like this, it required uh, Soviet officials with experience in World War II uh, to plan the offensive. And so that's what they did. Ambassador Stikov reported on June 16 that the offensive would begin on the 25th. The first stage formations and units of the KPA will begin action on the Ongjin Peninsula like a local operation and then deliver the main strike along the western coast to the south. At the second stage, Seoul should be taken and the Han River put under control at the same time, on the Eastern Front, North Korean troops will liberate the cities of Chuncheong and uh, Gangneung. As a result, the main forces of the South Korean army have to be encircled around Seoul and eliminated. The third stage, the final one, will be devoted to the liberation of the rest of Korea by destroying the remaining enemy forces and seizing major, major population centers and ports. There also was a lot of discussion among scholars, particularly in the 80s and 90s, uh, that this war should be seen as just a continuation of the border fighting that happened in 1949, that it should not be seen as um, an offensive action beginning you know, deliberately on June 25th, but that's not the picture that emerges from the Russian uh, records. It was planned, uh, very carefully planned and prepared as a major offensive action, something quite different from the border fighting. There was a bit of a change on June 21st, uh, June, yeah, 21st. Um, just four days before it was to begin, uh, Stikov reported to Stalin that the Southerners have learned of their plans and as a result, they're reinforcing their position on Ongjin. You see on this map on the west, Ongjin Peninsula, 
is divided by the 38th parallel. Nowadays, it's all part of North Korea. Uh, but at that time, the southern part, you see there was a portion under um, the 38th parallel. That portion was part of the Republic of Korea. So it was exposed. It was a vulnerable area. So that why was the idea, uh, why there was the idea to begin the operation there, where South Korean forces would be cut off from the main South Korean forces. But because they got this report that the South had learned of their plans, they changed their mind, right? So therefore, Stikov reported that instead of a local operation at Ongjin as a prelude to the general offensive, Kim Il-sung suggests an overall attack on June 25th along the entire front line. And that is what happened significant, I think, because it was that blitzkrieg-like action that so alarmed all the West, uh, the Western governments and many governments around the world and other places as well. So what do we now know? Both South and North uh, wished to use military force uh, to unify Korea. But only the North was empowered to do so. Kim Il-sung was the initiator, initiating the idea, pressing the Soviets to agree to it. But it was Stalin who made the decision, yes or no. Stalin decided to approve the offensive only when he calculated that the US would not intervene. Soviet advisors worked together with North Korean military officers to plan the attack, and the Soviet Union provided all necessary equipment and supplies. So I think we can conclude that the perception on the part of all of those countries that joined the UN command was accurate. Uh, this was a Soviet operation. It was also a Chinese operation in the sense that Mao Zedong agreed to it, but only after Stalin had made the initial approval. Well, we can make other conclusions about this, and uh, in the Q&A time, perhaps you'll raise you know, other possibilities, but I leave us with just one overwhelming conclusion, which is that if the U.S. had made it clear in 1949 and 1950 that it would defend the Republic of Korea, the war would never have started. And that conclusion then uh, very much informs military affairs here on the peninsula and has ever since 1950. So, the importance of deterrence is uppermost uh, in the minds of South Korean military and political leaders as well as the Americans.